webinar on buying and owning a holiday home in France, sponsored by Blevins Franks. My name is Karen Tate. For the past 20 years, I've been editing French property news and attending our property exhibitions. I'm joined today by our French property experts, Dan Newton of Agence Newton and Peter Grady of Prestige Property Services. So we'll start off with some information from each of them about what they do. And then we'll get started on some of the many questions you've already sent in. You'll also be able to submit questions while we're live. And sorry if we don't get around to answering them all, but you can get in touch with us by email afterwards. We'll also have a couple of polls running during the webinar for you to take part in if you wish. The webinar will be recorded and sent to you afterwards in case you've missed anything or want to watch it again. So over to you, Dan. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, as Karen kindly said, I'm Dan Newton. Uh, I've lived in France for 36 years now and have been dealing in property here for a pretty well that duration as well. And have been freely licensed as a French estate agent here since 19, sorry, since 2003 exactly. And now we run an agency which covers 17 departments of France, mainly the Western regions in Brittany, Normandy, uh, Limousin, Corrèze, Cassie and Perigord. Lovely, thanks very much, Dan. And Pete? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Grady from Prestige. Uh, I'm representing a network of professional property managers operating across many parts of France. Uh, all of our uh, property managers are fully registered, insured and uh, police checked, which is quite important. We offer two levels of service. The key one for me is uh, looking after people's holiday homes, their gardens, their pools, uh, their houses. And the second element is significant for today, which is making that holiday home pay for itself. So we get involved in advertising and promoting properties and dealing with guests, bookings, contracts, payments, etc. Lovely, thanks, Pete. So let's start off with a buying question. Dan, someone has asked, having never bought a property before in France, plus they can't view in person. What's the best advice on how to go about looking for a property in France, apart from looking on websites? Well, I think the best thing to say is certain things haven't changed. What you first need to do is draw up your shortlist of what you're looking for and the type of property, number of bedrooms, size of gardens, etc., uh, And the geographical area you're looking for taking into account obviously traveling and the actual aspect of the countryside around you or town or whatever you want. After that, since the COVID-19 effect, things have changed quite drastically as everyone knows. Um, but in a certain way, in real estate in a good way, lots of agencies now or more and more so are geared up to the actual virtual side of tours via either virtual tours themselves, video tours or live video tours. So you can get a very good feel for a property already with that. Obviously, it's never as good as seeing the actual property, but you get a very good idea. One thing you won't get necessarily from an agency or notary, though, is the actual information about the general area. So you need to do a bit more research on that, of what is directly around the actual house, uh, as in, well, directly, whether the farm buildings, factories, anything like that, or is there the local shops, how close is the closest town, how close is the coast, etc. So a bit more research on your side, but at the same time, things are facilitated by the agencies over here with the new technology. Great. So basically, do all your research beforehand, and uh, make the agents your friends because they can they can help you. You don't have to just go through the website. You can speak to them on live Zoom or or on the phone. So yeah, research, research. Pete, another participant has asked, what are the typical running costs of a holiday home? What costs do people need to bear in mind? Okay, so good question. There's quite a few points to cover, but very briefly, the first two are taxes, I'm afraid. It's a horrible word, but it does exist. You can't escape them. One is the tax foncier, it seems to be a house and land tax. And typically, I mean, for example, myself, I pay 700 euros a year for a small townhouse with a small garden. The second tax is a tax d'habitation, probably the nearest equivalent to your council tax in the UK. 
Um, and it does include a, a TV license component. It's rather generous of the, of the state. But our own tax habitation for the same house would be about 700 euros as well. So the two taxes combined, Foncia and habitation, probably come comparable with the council tax in the UK. And the estate agent should know about these figures to give you full warning before you buy. The next area, very obvious, is your buildings and contents insurance. These are and other utilities like your electricity, your water type bills. Uh, be careful with phone. If you want to have an inter a landline installed, there'll be a running charge for that. If you just want internet, there's very, very uh, good pay by page go options like an airbox, for instance, from Orange. The other thing to consider is you probably need someone to look after your house in terms of holding a key, doing property checks, looking after the garden, the pool, etc. A property manager can do this for you, but they will charge between 20 and 30 euros an hour based on the different parts of France. To give you a clue, the further south you go, the more expensive it is. And the only thing to mitigate that, if you were to buy an apartment block, you'll probably end up paying a fixed annual maintenance charge to a management company, which means there's no payments to a property manager, but included in your standard and your fee would be the upkeep of a pool, communal areas, gardens, et cetera. That's probably about it initially. That's great, thank you, Pete. Um, someone else has asked, can you just briefly take me through the process of buying a property? When are we committed to the purchase and what would happen if we pulled out? How long does it take and what fees are involved? And, uh, Another person has asked if they should get a survey before they buy two. Um, briefly, a long process and a brief description. Uh, basically, when you purchase a house, obviously you can find the property you want. Then after that, uh, what the normal process these days is to do a written offer, which is then countersigned by the actual vendor. Uh, once that's done, we then move to the company uh, part of the sale where we actually get all the national surveys, et cetera, done. And then that is drawn up, signed the company, and from the company, you are talking about three months uh, for the actual sale to go through. At the moment, lots of sales going on, so it does drag on sometimes, possibly up to six months, but usually between three and four months, it's covered. Um, after that, cost involves, if you're looking at agency sales, uh, the actual prices advertised do include agency fees, if you're looking at a notary's office, uh, you'll need to add on about four and a half percent for his fees for the negotiation. And then you actually have the legal fees for the sale, which is a sliding scale based on prices, but a ballpark figure. If you work on that six percent, you should be OK. After that, for the actual surveys, uh, one thing you don't want to do is confuse the English style survey with what the French call the diagnostic. Uh, the English surveys is a surveyor goes in, looks around the property, gives his own personal opinion. The diagnostics in France are very much in the sense that an expert goes through, he will take readings, for example, with the lead paint, etc., a Geiger counter, with the um, electrical insulation, he'll go around and test the lights or test the, the plugs, etc. He'll give you individual reports on each feature. So that's how the French do it. Saying that, if you do want a survey, uh, English style survey, it is possible in, in France, there are several surveyors who have actually set up office over here, fully registered and insured. But you must bear in mind, it is purely for your own, uh, your own opinion. It doesn't actually carry any legal bearings on a sale over here. Lovely, okay, thanks. Um, the basic difference is that the sale is binding earlier on mm -hmm. in the process when you first sign the, the first sales contract using the company Devont. Okay, lovely. Um, okay, is there anything people should bear in mind when viewing properties if they're going to use it purely as a holiday home rather than a permanent home? Yeah, there's a couple of scenarios to consider really. If the home is primarily for your own use, you don't want to let it out. Um, th the first piece of advice, quite strong advice is please don't buy too many renovation projects. What will happen is, as a holiday home, you'll try and spend your six or eight weeks, if you're lucky, visiting it. And like many friends of mine, you will do nothing but work on the house and you'll actually have no holiday time at all. You may come to regret that after a couple of years. Uh, you also, as I mentioned earlier, need to factor in the cost of paying someone to maintain gardens and pools when you're not there. Okay. 
And to turn it on its head, because it's not a permanent residence, when you're looking for properties, you're probably a lot less bothered about the travel network, local facilities, schools, big shopping centers and the like. And you may want this, this idyllic place in the country. That's fine. Just be aware of what you're looking for. As Dan said, get your checklist lined up properly. The second scenario, if you want to let it out the holiday maker, so you want to buy something, probably to make it pay for itself or turn a little bit of profit, then be prepared to look at more modern properties that could even offer you a turnkey solution. I've recently given advice to people, Americans and Australians who bought without seeing the property. They bought modern properties, fully furnished, well decorated, and they're ready to go. They're bought with all the trimmings inside. Also be aware of the, the letting season. You cannot change the market. If you want to buy in a ski resort, great news for you because you have two seasons. Your accommodation will be busy in the ski season and if you're lucky, you'll have a summer walking season as well. Coastal properties will do well in townhouses, but please be aware of the, the rural properties which may have a shorter season. And the most pronounced example of that, uh, there's many pictures of large sheep complexes with pools, which will appeal to families holidaying and they want to spend their school summer holidays, that July and August period there, but it may have a limited appeal to other types of holiday maker for the rest of the year. Now that could be the other 10 months of the year uh, where to get winter lets, your property would need to be well insulated, have efficient heating options, for instance, and other local interest. But with, with, on balance, I think most properties bought sensibly can pay for themselves or turn a small profit. Okay, great. Um, Dan, do you have any further advice for, for people looking to buy a, a property that they're going to use as a, a holiday let to provide an income? Well, I think Pete's covered quite a, quite a few of the, the actual points. Uh, saying that, what I would say, though, is actually when you're looking into it, it's possibly go on the rental sites and compare local rentals as well, what the costs are, so see how much you're earning. A uh, very good case, for example, in lots of areas is the difference between a house with a pool and a house without a pool, the actual difference in income you can get on that. Uh, after that, me personally, uh, when I go looking for holiday rentals, I take into account what local tourist attractions are in the area, whether it be the coast or the mountains, but also for like, chateaus to visit, uh, parks to visit, amusement centres, et cetera, et cetera, depend, all depending on what your taste is. So you need to check that out as well. Once again, research, as we mentioned earlier, and, and also the proximity uh, to ferry ports, airports, and road access. Great, thank you very much. And Pete, what taxes, if any, should buyers be aware of at a second home, both those that aren't rented out to holiday makers and those that are? Okay, um, if you're not renting out your holiday home, then it's as we've already stated, the two taxes would be tax uh, foncier and tax d'habitation. If you choose to let out your property though, we go to a different level and there's two other things to consider. One is a must. You must register your property with your local mayoree to get licensed to let out your property. Now what this triggers, it, may, it puts you into officialdom for the first time. It triggers the collection of a tax de séjour, as they call it, a tourist tax for most communities. It used to be applied only to hotel stays at a few centimes a night, but the local trezors have realised that self-catering accommodation could contribute to the coffers as well. An example of what it means though, let's give you, if five adults stayed in a place for five nights, so that's 25 nights of total stay, it could incur a tax de séjour of one euro per person per night, or 25 euros. It's not a massive figure, but it's another cost to consider. And you as owner will be culpable to pay that to your commune on a monthly or quarterly basis. The second one, second one is a social charge. This is a heftier payment. Now, whether you're tax resident in France or not, you should pay social charges on your rental income emanating from your French holiday home. Now, the French have decided that they're going to levy 17.2%, but quite a chunky figure, on a proportion of your rental revenue, not the full amount, a proportion. And that could be as much as 50% the proportion of your rental revenue. That's if you do nothing. You can benefit from a lower proportion where that tax is levied if you classify your gîte. 
Now to get classified, it's like getting a rating in the UK. You're inspected by an independent body and you're awarded a one to five star rating, which is valid for five years. It may cost you 700 euros to get it done, but if you go through that process, instead of being taxed or levying a social charge on 50% of your revenue, it's only levied on 29%. And that's a big enough differential, bear in mind you could be paying for several years to make it worth classifying yourself. Now, the other thing is super emotive. People ask, what about the income tax? Well, basically it doesn't apply to you if you live outside France. If you're a tax resident in the UK, you should pay the tax to say jour, as I mentioned, and the social charges, but your income tax liability is based on the tax regime of the country you live in. The only ironic thing in France, bless them, is although there's a social charge to collect, they collect it via the annual French tax system to confuse everybody. So you're not paying a tax, you're paying the social charge levied via the annual French tax system where you fill in one form. That's it in a nutshell. That's the summary, the very brief overview. Yeah. Taxes are always complicated, aren't they? And one thing is that for sure, you can't avoid that income tax. It just depends on where you actually live, where you're tax resident and where you pay it. Okie dokie. Um, so a lot of people are wondering how easy it is to split the time between the UK and France now. As since Brexit, British nationals are only allowed to spend three months and every six months within the EU, which is known as the 9180 days rule. This means you could spend three months in France or 180 or 90 days, but would then need to return to the UK for another three months before you could return to France or another EU country. So the total you can spend within the EU is six months in a year, but it has to be broken down into three months chunks. If you want to spend longer in France you still can but you need to apply for a long stay visa. We've more information and articles about this on our website completefrance.com and we'll share a link on the chat function here and in the email that goes out to you later. But Dan, we're wondering have you found this new rule to be an issue for British house hunters looking for a French holiday home? Are your clients worried about it? How much time they can spend there? Has it put some off buying at all? Um, well, I think it's certainly put some off. But then again, there's been, I think there's been a lot of scaremongering about this. Uh, the thing is, actually, it's, a, it's not a law which was brought out for Brexit. It was a law which existed before. And it's only just due to Brexit. It's now coming to play for the English. And um, the thing is, a lot, of, a lot of talk about this. There's quite a buzz on the social media all over the place. The thing is, if people sit back and think about it, not that many people do actually spend more than three months in a holiday in one, one spell. Okay, admittedly, there's those who do go and spend a whole summer or a whole winter in a particular area, and that, that might play on those. But the majority of people will be coming over a few weeks here, a few weeks there. And with some, just as long as you actually pay attention to the actual days, it shouldn't cause any real problem to it at all. Um, we've had lots of questions about it, lots of people asking, but if you ask me, besides the ones who go away for a whole summer season or a whole winter season, it doesn't really change that much. And I, when I first moved to France, it was in existence and I always remember talking to the customs and okay, admittedly at this time they do stamp your, your passports, but in those days, in the end, they weren't even stamping passports. They said you don't, they don't even know when you've been to France. So I think there's a lot of talk about well, it does exist. Well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say a lot of talk about nothing, but getting close to that, certainly. Yeah, because because even prior to this, you know, if you spent more than six months in France, then you're then it comes into question where you're tax domiciled, where you are actually okay. deemed to be resident. So it was always an issue. But as you say, uh, passports weren't stamped before, so it was easier to fly under the radar, which we wouldn't recommend, by the way. <laughs> so, OK. Um, it's time now for our first poll, which should be appearing on your screen. Should be appearing on your screen. It, yes, there you go. Right, moving on to the next question. So, um, Pete, 
After the past 18 months, um, it's not surprising at all that someone has asked us, what if we can't get out to France in the future because of, say, another lockdown? How expensive is it to get someone to mow the lawn and just check on the house? What if I need a builder or a plumber to visit when we're not there? Yeah, we've been inundated with such requests, not a surprise at all. So people that wouldn't normally turn for help in France because they are very independent, they visited their house often enough, now are seeking help. Uh, once again, property managers are a good place to start because the, the request could be as diverse as I want someone to look at my house for the first time in 18 months to cut the grass. It's probably going to be a hay wane by then or to do a bit of admin searching time to find particular trades. Uh, there could be a known plumbing or electric, electricity issue in the house. Uh, to pay someone to do that, offer those services, I don't mean the plumbing and electrician, that would be their own dovey for that, but you could pay as much as 25 euros an hour for those sorts of things. But the good thing is that most property managers are prepared to do this on an ad hoc basis, rather than you committing to them for the next 12 months or seeing them through the winter and the summer as well. Uh, the key thing is that anybody or any property manager, especially recommending a tradesperson, should make certain for you that they are registered and insured. And in this case, I mean like a decimal insurance so that plumbing, electrical work and other significant work is covered for 10 years and preferably with references and reviews as well. Otherwise, you could end up working or having somebody work for you doing significant work who was actually working on the black, not properly insured or registered. And that has consequences for you and for them. So it's not a problem, it can be taken care of. Lovely. Okay then. Um, Dan, we always get lots of questions about where to buy in France, the best places. Are you finding any, any locations are particularly sought after for holiday homes at the moment? Uh, is it best to buy by the sea, for example, or in the mountains or a typical French village? Um, at the moment, what's going with all which is going on, uh, the general phrase, which, whether it be for a holiday home or a permanent residence, is go for green. Uh, people are moving to the countryside. Uh, that can be coastal countryside, obviously, or mountain countryside. But the, basically, the actual going for the areas where they've got space around them, so if anything does happen lockdown-wise, they'll be okay. After that, on the actual geographical sectors as such, we're still on the actual pretty well the same group of uh, areas we had before, as in Brittany, Normandy, Corrèze, Limousin, Perigord, and the Côte d'Azur, which are the main ones. Okay, so the traditional areas are still very popular. Completely. Lovely, okay then. Um, Pete, we all dream of that beautiful French character property with a gorgeous swimming pool, perhaps an infinity pool with views out of the distance, but what are the actual pros and cons of having a pool at your holiday home? And what's the best way to maintain one? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, obviously the benefits, it's tremendous. When the temperatures hit the high 30s or 40s or whatever, what better place than your own pool? Um, like a secondary benefit if you're letting out as well is that, as Dan mentioned earlier, you should expect to get at least 20%, probably 20 and 50% more on your weekly rental amount because you have the pool. So a great asset, but beware. In France, uh, the climate, especially in the south, means that from about April to October, you've got this long window where the water temperature is high enough for someone to have to look after your pool on a regular basis. And if you're not there, it could be that you have to pay for weekly visits, in some cases twice weekly, but that's a little bit OCD perhaps. But the weekly visits are needed very, very quickly because you have to keep the water circulating, to keep it oxygenated, to keep it filtered, to keep it clean, remove debris from the pool, sanitize it with chlorine and bromine, put in the chemicals, the pH plus, the pH minus, and take care of heaters, which by definition will go wrong at some point, will stop heating the water. So you can very, gather very quickly from those things. There's quite a lot of content and technical nature to the work. And for that reason, I would suggest employing an expert, someone who knows pools well. And once again, it's this hourly rate of 25 to 30 euros an hour or more uh, that you should expect to pay. You may then consider the whole thing to be too expensive and overhead. But coming back to your first point, aren't they nice when you've got one? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, not difficult to see the pros in terms of enjoying it yourself and obviously it helps with lets, but be realistic about the maintenance. You know, it does need to be done frequently, otherwise you'll end up with a green slimy pool, which no one wants. Uh, on that same subject, Dan, um, is it best, somebody's asked, is it best to buy a property with a pool already in place or build one yourself or rather get the builders in to do it. Is there anything people should bear in mind when they're looking at uh, holiday homes to buy with pools? Um, well, whether you build it or buy it with it, I personally, I'll say choose a house first. If you want a house with a pool, 99% um, of the time we can get a pool in there if there's not already one. Obviously, make sure you've got the space for it. And... Um, Going with a pool, if you're buying a house with a pool, I tend to find prices tend to be a bit boosted because it's got a pool. Uh, saying that, um, one thing you do want to make sure is to actually have the right to have a pool, because although I say most of the time you get a pool in, it is well worth making sure it is a, actually a expensive clause in the offer that you can have a pool put in to make sure that you don't have a nasty surprise once you bought the house. Um, things to bear in mind, whether the pool is there or you're putting it in, is security on it. Uh, the legal system in France, if you don't have a security system on your pool, you're risking a fine of up to 45,000 euros. And admittedly, that hasn't been that enforced recently. But I think with more and more rentals going on with pools, that will be coming into play a lot more often. And there'll be, there will be checks on it. So basically, to summarise, if you want a house with a pool, let the agent know you want a house with a pool, but don't worry whether it's there or not yet. If it's not, put a suspensive clause in and you're okay. I personally, I'd, I'd rather build my own because I've got my own choice then. Okie dokie. And when you say a suspensive clause, put a clause into the contract that the sale right. would be binding only if you can get planning. Exactly. Okie dokie. Um, Pete, one for you now. Somebody's asked, what maintenance tips do you have for owners before they leave their holiday home for a while, such as shutting water off or closing shutters? Yeah, it's a good question. Very straightforward. We actually have a checklist that we offer to owners, so it makes it nice and painless for us. Uh, seven things to mention. Yes, turn off the water and take a meter reading. The reason you take a reading is there could be a leak while you're away and you may come back to find not just a flood of some degree, but a rather large water bill unexpectedly. Number two, turn off the electric and take a reading as well. This isn't because of something leaking. This is in case somebody uses your house while you're away. You may be able to determine that by checking on a reading. But the two, there's a couple of cases where you may not want to turn the electric off. One is you may have a VMC, as they call them, a Ventilation Mechanic Controle. In a lot of older rural houses, these are used to run 24-7 to take humid air out of the house. They should not be turned off, otherwise the fabric of the house will suffer. And the second reason, you may have a last chest freezer full of food, great food, cuts of meat and fish and whatever. And of course, if you're absent for several months, you come back, you have no idea whether that's defrosted because of a power cut and tripped back on again, tripped off, tripped back on again. Your food could be damaged. Very simple thing to do. Half fill a glass full of water and put it into the freezer so it freezes. And just before you leave the house, open the freezer and turn the glass upside down. If on your return you open the freezer and there is no water in the glass, then at least once that has defrosted, okay, and it is your choice whether you use the freezer contents or not. Number three, activate your mice protocol, whatever you decide that is. For many it's putting down poison all over the place, that may not be very pet friendly or whatever, but some plug in sonic devices or maybe let the neighbours cat in through a cat flat, whatever you choose though, but activate that protocol. Number four, you've alluded to this already, consider leaving the windows open, but close and secure the shutters. This is a favourite with many French families. Uh, it's completely safe and it's their way of keeping the house ventilated. Number five, tell the neighbours and the gendarmes that you're leaving. The neighbours especially, they're like a neighbourhood watch for you. They're very quick to react. And the gendarmes, that's a bit debatable. Some may take more interest than others. Number six, activate security cameras if you have them. They're probably Wi-Fi driven and remotely controlled. 
And number seven, perhaps one of the most important is arrange for someone to empty your post box on a regular basis. They're quite pronounced and visible in France in many cases. They're chock of luck with publicity. What better invitation to a potential burglar that there's nobody in the house? So those are standard seven points as a minimum. Yes, yeah, some great tips there. I love the uh, glass of water in the freezer one. Very good. Never heard that one before. So, yeah, brilliant. Okie dokie. Um, Dan, as well as all the quintessential little French cottages, many holiday homes are actually sort of newer apartments in a block or houses on a complex. We've been asked, what are the benefits and pitfalls as buying, of buying as part of a co-proprietor? Um... Well, personally, I'd say horses for courses, whether buying a co-propriety or not. Uh, after, after the thing you need to be careful of when you're buying a co-propriety is what the actual possible manual, uh, monthly costs are or annual costs. Because uh, upkeep of the site, for example, if you're in a block of flats, it could, uh, the actual could have a cleaning lady could have a concierge, a concierge in place. That has to be paid for. Uh, electricity for the actual heating of the common areas needs to be paid for. If you're buying on a complex, there's other things, the upkeep of the actual grounds, uh, the pool, etc. Benefits being you've got grounds, you've got pool, but <laughs> so you have to think them through. Saying that, uh, basically, when you do, do want to go down that line, make sure you know what those costs are. Uh, but as Pete's mentioned, there is cost to actually owning your own private home as well, especially if you're not there permanently. Keep them get up. Get, so it's very much a case of a balancing game uh, to compare the costs of having a private home and what you want to do with it, or actually having a co-propriety, either in flat or in a complex, what the annual costs are, um, comparing the two, and then seeing what suits yourself, basically. Okay, lovely. And buying on these sort of holiday, these sort of holiday resort sort of complexes, you know, you, it's quite handy for meeting other like-minded people, and if, if you've got kids playing together in the pool, that's another quite a Certainly. sort of a aspect to that. Um, Pete, completely different subject now, although actually I was going to say it's somebody's asked what about security holiday home, that is actually another benefit sometimes of buying on, on a complex is that you have more, it's more lock up and leave friendly. But this question is what about security at a holiday home, is it best to have an alarm or cameras uh, and are there any insurance implications? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, the for me, the Wi-Fi security cameras are great and it's a no-brainer. I would always suggest that to, to any owner. Uh, they're great pieces of kit. They can be motion sensitive, so they can be triggered as somebody approaches the house. They can then follow that person. And the owner, you've seen these on TV adverts, can then control where they're pointing and can even speak to the intruder as well. So you can have a conversation with the would-be burglar. But we come across it very often because our property managers will approach an owner's house the camera comes on, it follows them for a bit. And clearly the owner's taking note of the right person has turned up. They're not checking their hours or anything, but it is a great deterrent as a first line. Anyone determined will get through that. You mentioned alarms. Alarms can be very effective, but I'll caveat that. Only if someone's near enough to actually hear it or it triggers a call to the gendarme. We've had an alarm go off on many occasions, several hours from us in France. And the only person that heard the alarm in the commune was the local mayor, who then got in touch and said, why do you allow this to keep happening? It's, it's not doing any good at all. It's just irritating the locals. So you must be sensitive to that. I think if you have one connected to the gendarme, it probably has more value. And bear in mind, these alarms can be for houses or for pools. Probably of greater value for a house with a possible intruder. With a pool, you would tend to do something Something different when you're not there. You may cover the pool or rely on the fence and the gate type mechanism. Um, regarding insurance premiums, uh, I think Dan told me the other day that he's had a 10% reduction offered to him for his, his new house, his insurance, and that's only if you install an approved alarm. So you may not have the same choice of alarm, and the chances are it's going to be quite an expensive setup, but you can benefit from smallish reductions in your insurance premium. Okay. Right. Thanks, thanks very much, Pete. Uh, it's time now for our second poll, which should be appearing on your screen.
give people a moment to answer that. Lovely. So um, another buying question for Dan. Uh, so they say, my French is not so good. Do notaires usually go through the contracts and everything in English? Um, notaries, well, they used to. <laughs> uh, these days, don't forget, obviously, notaries are higher education, obviously. Uh, most of them do speak a reasonable amount of English. Saying that, they don't necessarily use it in work. Uh, this is more and more the case for legal reasons and insurance purposes. So there will be actually, most notaries will be asking you to bring in an actual official translator. Um, once again, lots of agents over here speak English and some are accepted by notaries as that. Although most notaries once again will be bringing official translators which are court registered. Um, most notaries don't actually work with a particular translator. So you are free to actually uh, check out the market. Knowing that for a court registered uh, translator, the prices can vary for the same job from let's say 500 euros to 2000 euros. And they will come in, they'll translate the actual initial act, initial compromise for you. They'll uh, translate the act for you. And if you wish, they'll actually be there at the time of signing. So be prepared for that cost. Uh, because like I said, most notaries won't actually translate the actual sales agreement themselves. Okie dokie. So uh, if you do need an English speaking notaire, it's probably something to check right at the start when you appoint your notaire. Um, we actually did have a, a letter in to French Property News recently from somebody who'd who'd gone through the whole um, signing. It was the act of on the end, the final contract. They'd gone through the whole thing with the notaire and they'd really struggled with their French and they'd really studied up on it. And it, it was really stressful and difficult. And when it was all finished, the notaire just started chatting to them casually in English. And he spoke perfect English. So maybe check first is probably a, a good good bit of advice so um one for you now pete someone who asked about renting out their holiday home is it best to have your own dedicated website go through one or several of the various rental portals or do it via airbnb okay good question again um all right having your own website is something that can generate some interest if you're very good at producing a website and keeping it alive with blogs and reviews, keeping it animated and up to date. But for many, the main purpose of that is just to give more reference material once a booking's been retrieved from another source. And interestingly enough, I, I was so curious about this. We did a survey a couple of years ago on 3000 sheets, like a very representative sample, studied the bookings that they have and determined that statistically, I do stress statistically on average, that with and without your own website, it didn't make any difference to the number of bookings at all. It probably gave certain guests a lot more information after a booking had been secured, but it didn't create necessarily any more income. So my advice would be to use all channels, all means available to you, and don't deselect any of them. Uh, you can do this in most, some of the major portals without paying any upfront charges. It's a paper booking type setup. And you can go on to the, the, the big and ugly sites, as I choose to call them, like Airbnb, the RBO, TripAdvisor, Booking.com. Those are the four big players that are known to everybody. And they come at an expense, but they do have a good coverage. If you then supplement that with some of the regional sites that are brilliant, like Jeets.fr and Jeets.eu, they will target European and mainland European people, especially the French, Dutch and Belgians. There'd be no surprise to everybody uh, with the COVID era, we're in our second year now, that the staycations is the order of the day, not just in the UK, but same on the European mainland. And 90% of our guests this year across all properties are mainland European, probably 80% of them French, but a high proportion of Dutch. So you shouldn't just turn to what some people are more comfortable with. A lot of Brits like to advertise to British guests. Well, clearly the last two years, their revenue would have plummeted. So you have to be very open-minded and be prepared to change year on year and use different mediums. Um, what I also would suggest is don't forget social media in all its guises. Um, however, if like me, you're a very passive 
mere Facebook user and understands nothing else about social media, find your 17 year old child or whatever to do it for you, but don't deny yourself access. It will create a lot of business. Okay. Absolutely. And we hear that so often people, yeah, with their, their teenage children or grandchildren do all that side for them and often really, you know, take great pleasure and helping out their parents and grandparents with that side of things. The yeah, social media shouldn't be underestimated, fantastic uh, marketing tool. And you can also keep in touch with sort of previous guests as well and, and put out special offers. Uh, repeat bookings is a, a great thing to have. So yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Dan, a uh, different subject now. Somebody has asked, do you need a French bank account to buy a property in France, even if it's just a holiday home? Um, the easy answer to that is no. <laughs> uh, you don't need an actual French bank account to buy the house. Saying that, you'd be very advised to actually open one afterwards, uh, in the sense of you will have the running costs, as Pete's mentioned, the taxes, etc., uh your services most of your services won't like being paid from england they prefer to be paid in france in euros uh also avoids having the actual exchange rate problems on a daily basis um after that whether to go with one of the, the big banks advertising in the big mags are all over the place i wouldn't worry about that once again as i mentioned for notaries most bank staff are actually on higher education speak reasonable english uh, in France, the first language they tend to learn is English after French. Uh, so we actually have enough communication skills there. And what I do is actually wait to find where well, I bought my house, then actually go to a local bank there, because it literally is just around the corner. Uh, and that's the way it tends to work very, work very well over here, building up that relationship with your local bank. So simple answer, no, but still do it all the same. Okay, great. And, you know, if you if you don't have any French, do check first. If you go into your local bank, there is someone who can help you in English and you'll probably find, although, as you say, Dan, a lot of French people can, can speak English, um, maybe in some of the sort of more rural areas, they might not, whereas in areas where they're used to dealing with a lot of um, British and other nationality holiday homeowners, they're, they're a lot more likely to speak English to you. Oh, definitely. Okay. Um, Pete, um, back to renting out your holiday home. Um, somebody has asked, are there any safety measures they need, such as fire extinguishers or smoke alarms, and do they need special insurance to rent their property out? Um, okay. Uh, the only mandatory, well, there's two mandatory things. The first one is since 2015, so for a good few years, you must have at least one smoke alarm fitted to a house. Um, if you don't do that, you're probably going to invalidate your house insurance. It is as simple as that. There's a particular standard type number and spec as well. You go into any DIY store, you'll see them badged as that. So they're easy to pick out. You must have one in each house. That's regardless of whether it's a holiday home or not, by the way. The next thing is, um, and I would strongly recommend this, that's all I would suggest, that you install both a fire extinguisher and a fire blanket in the kitchen area, just in case they're needed. Um, but what may change that, if you go for a classification, I mentioned this earlier, you want to go for your one to five star rating. I think most of the star ratings will insist uh, that you have the fire extinguisher and fire blanket to get the accreditation. So that's a slight change there. The insurance is fascinating. I've never understood this. So many insurance companies fully understanding that you're going to let out to holiday makers do not increase the premium. Others will increase it by no more than 10%. There's no rhyme or reason. I can't give any justification for that or logic. It's just the way it is. And probably under safety, the keyest thing to mention, Dan's alluded to it before, is pool safety, swimming pools. Um, Consider two options. If, if it's an absent owner situation, so you're walking away from your pool for a significant amount of time, you can either rely on good fencing and a secure gate, or you can rely on rigid pool covers. I do mean rigid, not just these solar covers that are like a lilo on the water. Now, those are the two uh, favoured approaches. If, however, you have yourself or you're, or you're actually at your home or you have guests in situ, 
People then go for things like water motion alarms that go off when somebody falls into the water or a laser beam alarm. But the four things I've mentioned there, two for absent owners, two for owners in situ, that's the sum total of my knowledge and I am not giving advice. My only advice is consult a professional pool installation company because the regs change very, very frequently. I'm not abreast of those, but be aware it's one of the most significant items and as Dan mentioned, the fines are phenomenal if you make a mistake. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you don't want a huge fine. And of course, you don't want any accidents at your pools. So it's in your best interests all around to, to ensure you have those pool safety measures in place. Do they, do they um, also apply for the above ground pools, the sort of big paddling pools? It's a good point. I mean, you could put it, you could put a cover on, I suggest, or gate and fence them. Those things can be done. Uh, it may be a little bit harder to install laser alarms or whatever. But once again, I, I'm not the expert on specific pool safety, so I'm not going to give an answer because it might be construed as, as vice. So apologies, Karen. I'm not going to comment beyond that. No, no that's fine. The, the advice is, you know, obviously seek advice from a pool specialist to ensure you have those measures in place but that you do have to have those measures in place you can't just uh, have your pool open with no alarms or anything in France. It would just for many people Karen who have the above ground pools typically they're about a meter in height aren't they and if yeah. they're not just into a slope or the ground I do know a lot of owners are comfortable enough themselves just by taking the step ladder or the, the ladder out of the pool which in itself means you then have to climb at one meter to get in. But that's just what some owners choose to do. Yeah, you still need to check the legalities, obviously, as our, our advice to anyone considering that. Okay, um, Dan, uh, someone else has asked here, can they still take out a mortgage in France post Brexit? And are there any age limits or other restrictions? Uh, post Brexit, <laughs> uh, the actual Brexit thing is still fairly recent, as everyone knows. Uh, and at this particular time, it is quite complicated to get a mortgage. It's not impossible, uh, but it's quite complicated. I'd say most high street banks, uh, if you just walk in like that to talk to them, won't be necessarily interested with it. I'd definitely uh, suggest contacting one of the specialised English speaking French mortgage brokers. Uh, after that, any limits? Uh, well, obviously, you have to be over 18 to get a mortgage and have an income. Uh, one thing to bear in mind, though, because we do get lots of people thinking about getting somewhere very cheap, is they won't, uh, in France, they won't lend you under 50,000 euros. It's basically for they can, they can work out their actual risk of return in case you don't pay. They think, seem to deem that if you buy something under 50,000 euros uh, and they have to claim it back, they won't, won't get the money back. So the only two things, is, oh, well, three things, have an income, be over 18, and be borrowing more than 50,000. Okay, dokie. And, and with French mortgages, it is a different system to the UK. They, they will check all your outgoings as well as your ingoings, incomings. Incomings. <laughs> it's standard wrong. Um, and the best thing to do if you do need a mortgage is to go to a mortgage broker who specializes in French mortgages. They'll have access to the best products on the market. They'll be able to advise you accordingly and help you. And um, hopefully the process should become a little bit easier as um, everything smooths out after Brexit. Okie dokie. Um, Pete, someone else has asked, how easy it is to get involved in the community if you're only there for a, a couple of weeks a year or the odd weekend. This is a difficult one, isn't it? Um, especially if you don't speak very good French, you're going to find it more difficult and more awkward. So but when you are in your French community, whether it's for a week or two weeks, the key rule must be don't isolate yourself. That's easily said for some people who are outgoing but there are others that feel quite timid, especially with the language barrier. But you must get used to putting yourself outside your comfort zone and experiencing different things. But specifically to integrate, uh, I would suggest you start to use the local markets, the food markets, 
and talk to stallholders. Don't just timidly go along by and thrust the money at them. Engage in dialogue. They could end up being a friend. Um, use the local bars and cafes and restaurants and brocomps. You know, they're lovely places to wander around and in my case, not spend money. But my yeah. wife makes up for that, it's not a problem. But engage in dialogue in these places. They're gonna be locals there, locals to talk to. So um, consider attending and participating in local events. Don't just turn up and do nothing, but there could be local dances of all genre, uh, musical festivals, raclette evenings, uh, Christmas markets, all sorts of things like this. Um, invite neighbors for aperos. A peros, for those that don't know, is how long is a piece of string? It can mean from, I've invited you around for one glass of wine, I now expect you to go. Uh, a couple of glasses of wine and some nibbles, full to the full Monty, which is, you're going to get drunk in our house, you can probably eat all night, you can stay if you want to, and I'll ask you to leave in the morning. And you'll never get any warning beforehand what it's going to be. Um, you can join activity groups. You may not be there very often, but consider joining a walking group or dancing type groups. Consider, I've only come across this in France recently, sea walking. I think that's what they call it. I don't mean walking on water. What I mean is you don a wetsuit and you file a long line and you just follow each other like penguins about three, three feet out into the sea. And apparently you're exercising and talking all day long. So the French love it. If you want to fit in with that, you will find friends. And I suppose the keyest thing, this is the note to end on with this, is that once you've met a local, that's the easy bit in some ways. Keeping in touch is the difficult bit. But you should be able to keep in touch all year by using traditional letter, if you like writing letters or phone calls, even if the French is a, the language is a barrier. Consider email, consider Zoom, the medium we're using now, so you can still see your friend and neighbor. Consider WhatsApp, Facebook, all these social media techniques that the French have adopted the same as us. They're a little bit behind in some parts of technology, but these communication methods are used by the French of every generation. So use that to keep up the, the contact throughout the year. Then it's just a question of very easily dropping back in when you return for two weeks in summer or whatever. That's, that's such a good point. It is so easy nowadays to stay in touch with people. And that's something, you know, in, in the past that you couldn't do apart from sending a letter or perhaps an occasional phone call. It's much easier now to just stay sort of casually in touch with people, just, you know, drop people a, an email or an, a message on Facebook, whatever, see how they're doing and stay in touch. So that's, that's a really interesting point. And I have to say that, you know, in our real life features and French property news and our letters from people, we hear this time and time again, how much getting involved in the local community has enriched people's experiences of owning a holiday home. It's really become the thing that they love most about owning a holiday home. They may have fallen in love with the views or the pool or the beams, but in the end, it's, you know, Jean-Claude next door and, and, and it's the, the, the local market stall holder they've got to know and the restaurant they always go in. These are the things that, that really bind them to their holiday homes. So agree. We, we are actually um, coming towards the end of the uh, webinar and I think we've answered most of the questions now so that seems like a particularly lovely point to end on you know the reasons you buy a holiday home in the first place to to immerse yourself in that wonderful French way of life that we all love so um, I guess that wraps up our seminar today on holiday homes in France so thank you so much everyone for joining us I do hope it's been useful but you can contact any of us with any further questions after the webinar. We'll be very happy to help. Um, thanks to my fellow panelists, Dan and Pete. Thanks also to our sponsor, Blevins Franks. For more information about France and French property, please do visit our websites, completefrance.com and francepropertyshop.com where you can find lots of lovely holiday homes for sale. You can also find information about our magazines, French Property News and France Magazine. 
So um, please do join us for our next webinar. We'll include details by email with the recording and you can also find out more on our French Property Exhibitions website. So hope to see you next time. Bye now.